And that brings us to David Sabatini, who I think might be the worst case of all. I, I'm yeah. horrified by what you wrote. Not only did I read it, I then listened to it, uh, you know, uh, the audio of it. And then I shared it with everybody I knew. I, I want everybody to go to Barry Weiss's Substack and read this. But Susie's going to walk us through the basics of the story here. So who is David Sabatini? Right. Thanks, Megan, for that for that setup. David Sabatini is the most important scientist you've never heard of, right? So he studies something called the mTOR pathway. He discovered it when he was a graduate student. I don't really know about the mTOR pathway. I think it would take a PhD to explain. The important thing to understand is that the mTOR pathway, which Sabatini and his team of 39 researchers worked on, is essential to understanding cells and eventually the cure for cancer. Okay, so I think when we talk about overreach in the Me Too movement, we tend to think of fame producers or comedians or, or whoever it is. But I think it's a different story. And I think it requires a big magnifying glass when you're talking about someone who could potentially save the lives, uh, lives of millions of people with his research. So mm -hmm. David Sabatini had a consensual relationship with a colleague. Uh, it didn't end well. She later claimed that he harassed her. And now uh, one of the country's most important scientists who is getting something like four million dollars in funding from places like the American Cancer Society and the Pentagon. And he had won every science prize under the book. He was expected to win the Nobel as well. He's collecting unemployment. So he's unemployed and unemployable. And, you know, it's just a kind of crazy story. And it goes from MIT to um, NYU, who was thinking of hiring him. And it's a piece of what's happening in our whole culture. And it shows who has the power. Is it the people at the top? Is it the Robert Grossmans who run NYU's medical school? Or is it uh, a graduate student who claims that they'd be unsafe if David Sabatini were to continue doing his research in New York? Mm, my gosh. All right. So let's walk through it so people understand the slow murder of David Sabatini's professional career. I mean, this guy the who anatomy we need. of a takedown. It really is. And and we need this guy. And so, like, I look, you know, of course, I'm very open minded to somebody's Me Too claim. I, I, I don't think I have to prove that to anybody. Right. Um, but this is horrific. And what it sounds like to me, this is my opinion, is an affair that didn't work out. And somebody who decided she'd been jilted and wanted to get him. And boy, she did. And in this right. environment, you know, somebody like this woman who's very well credentialed saying the things she was saying about him, she's going to have a lot of power. So this woman had a consensual affair with him. There was an age difference. He was 50. She was 29. He had split right. with his wife. There was no allegation of like extramarital stuff or whatever. And he no. ran a lab at MIT and she was coming in. At, she was coming in to run her own lab at 29. Is that correct? That's right. So David was a principal investigator at his lab at MIT. And Kristen Knauss, who he had an affair with, was also an incoming principal investigator. Usually you don't get that position when you're so young. MIT has this sort of special program through the Whitehead Institute. So I won't deny that David Sabatini, as a rock star in his field, had more power than her. But technically, according to the Whitehead Institute, where they both worked, the only, you know, uh, the only rule he broke was not disclosing that he had a consensual relationship, which violated their consensual relationship policy. So mm -hmm. as much as this is about, you know, maybe a jilted lover, maybe someone who wanted to take another person down, I think it's also about what happens when we litigate sex to this degree, when mm -hmm. an affair becomes so procedural and your boss is involved in it. I mean, we're trying well, to like... Can I can I mm -hmm. say for the record, I will distinguish this from, for example, Jeff Zucker at CNN, who had an, a, a consensual affair with a colleague who was his underling, who he continued to promote up the ranks over other young women who worked at CNN. That's a deep problem. That's an ethical problem. This was not that situation. She had already gotten this position of running her own lab and, and the policy against uh, consensual affairs amongst the people in these positions didn't even kick in until after they'd already begun it. So, you know, whatever, he, he basically got hung up on a technicality. Right. So there's that technical aspect of it. And then there's the fact that according to this 250 page report that I reviewed uh, where they brought in these criminal investigators, including a, a DA to, to investigate uh, David Sabatini, a former state attorney, um, he violated their consensual relationship policy, which is the technicality. And then there was a lot of mushy language about how he violated the anti-harassment policy because his behavior created a sexual undercurrent in the lab. Uh, they said 
his relationship exacerbated things because of her because of his, quote, indirect influence over her and ran afoul of the spirit, if not the letter of the policy. So because you have these like bricks of legalese, you can find a way so that if you swore in the lab, that could count as harassment because it could make someone uncomfortable. Um, So we have the technicality aspect of it. And then the the bad behavior in the lab, which is what they really needed to get him kicked out, because if that's what makes it about the whitehead itself and everyone I spoke to about, you know, a dozen and a half people who work with David Sabatini say that his lab is the gold standard, um, that women there weren't uncomfortable, that it just wasn't in the air. So that's what where I think the whitehead really overstepped. Well, and this was one of the conclusions in their report. This is from your reporting um, mm. that they found Sabatini's propensity to praise or gravitate toward those in the lab that mirror his desired personality traits, scientific success or Mm -hmm. view of science above all else creates additional obstacles for female lab members. OMG. Because a woman can't believe that science above all else is the correct way to approach work (laughs) at a science lab. You know, (laughs) they're just way too concerned with having babies. I have no idea. I think think that that line really jumped out at me too. Yeah, it was absurd. The the absurdity of this. So So they come out with this report, all these, you know, people brought in to investigate him and he was forgive me, dismembered. I mean, piece by piece. He lost everything. I mean, some of those guys I, I mentioned had like a year suspension or like Roland lost control of his lab at Harvard where they did all these great studies on like police officers and, you know, black men and so on. Roland right. is a black man. Uh, so that happened. But the, he wasn't totally fired. Ultimately, the guy at Princeton was. But David, I mean, it was swift and it wasn't just the, the lab the professorship at MIT to talk to us about what happened to him. His prizes got taken away. His funding got taken away. When you're a scientist at this caliber, you're really reliant on these huge institutions, huge research labs. It's not like a writer who could just go start a sub stack and do something else. You know what I mean? If they, yeah. if they have to leave the mainstream. So David, um, got his, got his funding taken away, got his prizes taken away. He was on the board of a ton of startups in the Boston area that were biotech startups with, you know, missions like looking for the cure for cancer. Uh, and he tells me he wasn't living in his house because he couldn't stand the sound of the FedEx envelopes dropping into his mail slot, uh, which was invariably another uh, institution or startup or whatever it was cutting ties with him. He lost about 35 pounds. Uh, he doesn't sleep anymore. And you know, the real loss, I think, is to all of us. I mean, this was a guy at the prime of his life. And now he's shuffling around, taking care of his 11 year old, whom he shares custody of with his ex-wife and really doing nothing. And I think that is um, as much as loss to him, a a loss to to the country. Fourth of July is just around the corner. And if you're looking for the perfect cuts to put on the grill this year, look no further. Good Ranchers is the place to get American beef, chicken, and seafood. They sell 100% American meat, and they ship it straight to your door. And right now, Good Ranchers is putting the free in freedom with two free prime ribeyes with every order that uses my code, Megan. Other places would charge you well over 50, even 60 bucks a steak to get ribeyes like these, but Good Ranchers is giving them to you for free when you go to goodranchers.com slash Megan. They're out of their ranch in minds, but take advantage of it. This is not the time to wait. Know that you got to claim your ribeyes today because they could run out. It's a limited stock item. First come, first serve. And you want to be first when it comes to good ranchers. They deliver the best of American farms and ranches right to your door. Make sure you take time today. Right now, go to goodranchers.com slash Megan or use my code M-E-G-Y-N at checkout to get your two free 18 ounce ribeyes. Start the summer off right with good ranchers. American meat delivered. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.